The ripple effects for the protests for racial equality and social justice have been felt around the world. It's left a lot of families looking for ways to teach their kids about these issues. New York Times Parenting recently ran a piece about families who are protesting together and how the lessons are passed through generations. Let's take a look. Across the country and all over the world, within the seas of peaceful protesters are young faces. Children are protesting alongside their parents. In the Hargrove household, it was 13-year-old Caden who first decided to get involved. We thought it would be a good idea to go as a family. What I saw all around was that they felt embraced. They were excited about people honking their horns and supporting us. Um, and in the end, when I asked the five-year-old and the eight-year-old, how do you feel? What did that make you feel like? And they all said, I felt really good. I'm hoping that my children can see that they have power in their voice. Um, if they get together with people, that those changes can happen. We have uh, a struggle uh, as a family, so we have to march as a family. For Councilman Robert White Jr. and his wife Christy, peacefully protesting, is a family calling. From the youngest to the oldest, it's important that everyone feels that they have an obligation to do this and that they pitch in however big or small their contribution is, that they, they get up and they do it. In black families, you unfortunately always know when you have kids that there are certain life experiences that they are gonna have and that you have to prepare them for. Uh, I, I didn't, uh, think about the fact that I would have a three-year-old and a one-year-old uh, marching with me in, in what are really uh, civil rights marches. I hoped when I was younger that I wouldn't have to pass on these traditions, uh, but now I hope that my children won't have to pass on these traditions to their children because of the work we're doing now as a family. I think for our family, it was as simple as being invited by our friends. And our sort of family motto is that we show up um, and that's for a lot of things, you know, but, but specifically in terms of what's going on right now in our country. The Metcalf family is using this moment in history as a teachable one for their two sons. So the core philosophy in our house is that you might not control outside events, but you do control how you respond to those events. Our family will continue to protest and march until, um, until we're all equal. Jay Gioni Palmer and his eight-year-old son Middleton started marching together in early June after Middleton had questions about the death of George Floyd. I told him that as long as there's breath in, in my lungs, I would make sure that that never happened to him. Um, but more importantly, that we will not live in fear. So the two of us marched out, you know, down the street. And first day was just the two of us and then, um, you know, our numbers grew. Most of the days, of them, um, about half of the people who were out there were under the age of 12. And initially, the kids, some of the kids were scared. <clears throat> but I think as they, you know, more kids started coming and they started hearing the honks in support, that helped out a lot. So by the end, they, they were loving it. The road to racial equality is a long one, but these families are committed to that journey, one step at a time. It's a relay race. Right? We got to pass it on. The baton was handed to me. And I got to hand the baton off at some point. I need to teach him and his little brother and their friends how to catch the baton and don't drop it and pass it on, you know, when it's their time. So how can parents help their children's voices be heard? Helping us answer that question is George James, a licensed family therapist at Council for Relationships in Philadelphia. And psychologist Dale Atkins, the author of The Kindness Advantage. Welcome, guys. Let's start with you, uh, George. First of all, I just think the, I was just thinking about this, just the simple act of taking a piece of poster board and writing down a message uh, shows your kids something that you care enough in that moment that you are going to take action. What are you teaching your kids, even with that simple step? You know, I think any step, even that step, is modeling that this is what we believe. This, this is our family values. These are the things that we uh, are that are important to us. And what that does is that as they grow, as they become older, they now hopefully will take those values for themselves. And then they might be the ones leading uh, or making the signs in the future, or maybe making change down the road. 
Dale, you wanted to point out too that there's actual studies that show that if you engage your teens in social activism, they go further, that they're, they really push it. So talk about that. Yes, there was a study a year and a half ago, actually, um, before all that we're experiencing now that showed that when teens are engaged with volunteering, social activism, and voting, and most kids are too young to vote, but when they are engaged with social activism, it really affects how they perceive themselves in the world, that they go further academically, and they do better when they're out in the world financially, which is so interesting. They find a purpose and they find that they can really make a difference as George said. And I think when we encourage kids to do this, volunteering as well as being actively uh, engaged in political activism, that we see these changes because they become courageous, they become proud, they become connected to other people and a cause. And we see these changes, it's really remarkable. We'll keep the conversation going with George and Dale coming up after this. We are back with family therapist George James and psychologist Dale Atkins. As the protests for racial equality continue, we've been talking about what parents can do to help kids feel engaged and empowered. George, you know, we saw in the piece earlier that there were all, there's a diverse amount of families out there marching, protesting together. And I think, you know, we need to discuss how important it is that it's not just black families that are marching, that we all are showing support. So, so tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, this is really great and amazing that when we see multiple families from all different backgrounds, because racism is not a black people issue, right? It's, a, it's an injustice issue. Right. And so some, even though you might not experience it in your daily life, racism impacts all of us. And so, you know, when we see that, it shows us that everyone is involved. And it, it actually reminds me of Dr. King's quote where it says that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And so it's important that families recognize and teach that to their children. And, you know, even as a man, part of what I have to acknowledge is that sexism is not just a woman issue. It's an injustice issue we all have to speak up and highlight that. So when I see non-Black families at these marches, they're showing that their family, that we believe in justice and fairness, and that's a great value to share. Now we talked about, yeah, we've been talking about people going out and pro marching and protest and stuff. A lot of families aren't doing that, just basic, well, some, for some reason, it's because they don't know if it's safe, they don't want to be out in groups, you get all that, but part of teaching your children isn't only about getting out and marching on the street. This is about things that you're teaching in the home. And does it have to be, I was thinking, does it have to be something that your child is passionate about? Like, do you have to find their button? Mm -hmm. Is that what it's about? It helps if you find their button because then then they own it and they feel connected and they get and they get excited about something. So if we follow our children, if we listen to our children, we guide them, but we need to listen to what they're interested in because if they have a particular interest, they can use that interest for good. And I think what is really wonderful is, especially at this moment in time, there are so many avenues that people who aren't able to protest or choose not to protest actively can read with their children. They can watch movies. They can talk about heroes who certainly weren't mentioned when I was in school. And I think that what's really important is for each of us, of white, of black, every color, to really try to understand another person's perspective. This is a country of white privilege. And I think that it is really important for all of us to be able to learn with our children, be open, self-reflect. And the other thing is there are so many nonprofits that are oriented towards moving towards change. And we can volunteer, we can volunteer with our children and have conversations early with our kids. You know, kids notice differences. We are, we are hardwired to notice differences. When we talk about the differences in positive ways, when we talk about the fact that we are all connected, this movement is about connecting all of us. As George said, when one of us is hurt, all of us are hurt. The other thing I'd like to mention is these are conversations that should be going on for the rest of our lives. This yes. is a moment in time. And historically, these conversations stopped. And this needs to go on. So George, in, in that, can you give us First of all, you say that, yes, let's keep this conversation going. This isn't just a moment, you know, this is a movement. And then the other thing you said, which I think is particularly important, is the importance of self-care for Black families, to make sure that, that we are taking care of ourselves. 
Yeah, you know, I really appreciate you know what Dale said, and I completely agree that this has to be ongoing and not just a moment, but uh, right now, but ongoing. And that happens with what books do you read, what movies do you watch, what are the things uh, that your children learn in school, and how are you advocating mm -hmm. for that? What happens in your community? What are you? How do you vote? All these things are a part of it that you have the conversation and even digging deeper. That not just saying I'm not a racist, but I'm against anything that is that promotes racism, which might impact some of the things that you benefit from or some of the mm. things that that you experience in your daily life, which is privilege. And that's hard. But if you're willing to do that, that keeps the conversation going and it's long term. Even asking yourself, is it OK for my child or children to date other people? Things that sometimes we don't really think about until it happens. But I, I completely agree, once again, that self-care is important. And in particular, for Black families, there's a, a strong belief that like I can't take a moment off. I have to fight. I have to advocate. I have to be there. And that if I take time off for myself or my family, I'm doing something wrong. But that's not the case because we all need self-care. And there's also trauma that you're experiencing. So you need to rest. You need to play games with your family. You need to do those things that help you so yeah. that you can show up for the fight tomorrow or next week. Because self-care is just crucial and important. Dale and George, thank you so much.